Lord, good evening everyone. God bless you. Can I ask you to bow your heads and close your eyes just for a moment so we can invite the precious Holy Spirit. Glorious Holy Ghost, we invite you in our midst today. We ask you to quiet our spirits. Those that will be watching from around the world in a moment, would you quiet their spirits? Lord, would you give us spiritual ears to hear? Would you give us the understanding that we need? Would you strip away from us any form of dependency on anything else but you? And allow us, Lord, to hold on to you, rest on you, depend on you, and trust in you in every area of our lives. We invite you, sweet Holy Spirit, for your glorious presence to move upon us at this moment. Lord, your word says we shall know the truth and that that truth will set us free. We thank you for already making us free. And Lord, we pray that you would keep us free as we yield and we surrender to you, Lord. We bless your holy name. We worship you and we adore you. We thank you, Lord, for moving upon us now. Minister to us in Jesus' mighty name. Everybody said, can we have the lights in the sanctuary so everyone can read their outlines? Thank you. Praise the Lord. I'd like to welcome those that are watching internationally and from around our country. Brothers and sisters, tonight as we continue to talk about cults, I want to talk about Hinduism. And we might say to ourselves, what's the importance of that? That's on the other side of the world. We live in Belize and we don't observe such a thing as Hinduism. Well, let me tell you something. Hinduism is the very mother of what is known today as Satanism, as the spiritual cults, the spiritual movement today that we know around the world. And it is important because the New Age movement was birthed from that and you need to see some of the similarities. Besides that, some of us might have had parents that are Hindus. And you need to understand that it flows in the bloodline. So listen carefully and follow with me on your outline so that you don't get lost. Hinduism, Hindu philosophy holds that human beings are micro cosmic creatures how they came into being is not important as what they are and where they're going I want to give you a little key of that statement that is suggesting that Hinduism teaches spiritual evolution just like we know about the theory of evolution, physical evolution, material evolution, Hinduism actually teaches spiritual evolution, which we will see in a moment. The Hindu philosopher Vivekananda said, It is a sin to call a person a sinner. Since Hindus strive to attain purity by becoming a God. That's just quite the opposite of what the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches that we are all sinners. We were all born sinners. But yet one of the religious philosophers of Hinduism said that it's really a sin to call people sinners. Are you with me so far? The, the revered Mahatma Gandhi, a very famous person, even around the world, said, a man may not believe in God and still be a Hindu. I don't know if you understand what that is suggesting. That Hinduism is really a religion of disorder. It incorporates and attracts 
every form of belief. In other words, it is not theological. Any person in the world can start to follow Hinduism and become a part of it because it doesn't matter what you believe in. It's just another God that will be added to Hinduism. Because of sayings like these, Hinduism is the most absorptive and embracing religion in the world. You know, most religions have certain criterias to enter that religion. Hinduism has no criteria. You come in with whatever you believe and it becomes Hinduism. Hinduism may be viewed as religious anarchy, which is disorder, chaotic, chaos. So really, it is anarchy in action due to the absence of authority. Hinduism is perhaps also the world's oldest false religion, third largest religion in the world today. Christianity being the first, Islam being the second, and Hinduism being the third largest religion. Hinduism is largely responsible for the New Age spirituality, the occult, and satanic movement in the Western Hemisphere. In other words, there are a few hundred million Hindus in North America or in the Northern Hemisphere. And they come with this belief and it rubs off on the people in the Western Hemisphere. And it has evolved today what we know as Satanism, as the New Age movement, as the occult. So today there are millions and hundreds of millions of people that are not Hindus or does not observe Hinduism. But they are involved in New Age movement. They are involved in the occult. They are involved in Satanism. And these things were birthed from Hinduism. Hinduism is strongly based on deep-rooted witchcraft and idolatry. Hinduism is very intentional about connecting with pagan gods, which are demons. What people, what pagan religions would call gods are actually what the Bible teaches as demons. Hinduism proverbially has 33 million gods, which is metaphoric for an infinite array of gods. In other words, for Hindus, everything is a God. So when we talk about 33 million God, which already is almost innumerable, it's just metaphoric for an infinite array of gods. There's no count on how many gods there are in Hinduism. Krishna, who is referred to as the eighth incarnation of Vishnu, a major Hindu god in the Bhagavad Gita said, I am the prince of demons. So listen carefully. Krishna, who is an avatar of Vishnu, says that he is the prince of demons. So really, when Hindus worship Krishna, what are they doing? They're worshiping the prince of demons. And who does the Bible say the prince of demons is? 
Satan. He is the devil. So Satan, Lucifer, presents himself to Hinduism as Krishna. But to the Christians, we know him as Satan himself. The devil. So really Krishna has no problem telling the Hindus, I want you to know that when you worship me, you're actually worshiping Satan. The prince of demons. But again, for Hindus, that's not a problem because it's not about theology. It is about an experience. In Romans chapter 1 and verse 21 through 23, here's what the Bible says. Because although they knew God, they did not glorify Him as God, nor were thankful, but became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Listen. Professing to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like a corruptible man. And this is mostly what Hinduism does. They make creatures gods. Animals gods. And they worship these things. The Bible says that they change the glory of the incorruptible God into image like corruptible man. In Exodus chapter 20 verse 3 through 5. It says, you shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a carved image, any likeness of anything that is in heaven above, or that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them, nor serve them. For I am the Lord your God. I am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generations of those who hate me. So with that said, I'm going to take a brief pause. And I'd like to ask Richie if you could cut the lights and play this 15-minute video so we can see what this idolatry looks like in Hinduism. Temple is home to goddess Karni Mata, who has been worshipped here by Hindus for over 600 years. There's estimated to be over 20,000 rats living here at the temple, although the locals are having trouble keeping count, thick as well. Like all Hindu temples, as a measure of respect, you must take off your shoes at the entrance. Oh, joy. Wish me luck. Okay, so let's get this out of the way up front. I'm not crazy about rats. Never liked them. In fact, they horrify me. Believe me, it is not a joy to be walking around barefoot on this sticky floor stepping in rat pee. So I'm letting you know I'm putting on my brave girl face just for you. <laughs> I'm so, oh my God, I can't believe it. Oh, I'm gonna jump on other people. <laughs> Come on, Shanaz, pull yourself together. From the moment the temple doors open early each morning, an endless stream of worshippers bring the rats all kinds of yummy offerings. Local treats, bananas, peanuts, cookies, milk and lots of other goodies. There's even a dedicated temple chef whose job is to cook only for these rodents. Can you imagine that? Senas, come, join me. Okay, I'm a little scared, sir. <laughs> they are not going to bite you. Okay, I'm sitting here only for you, Mr. Babu. Yes. 
You just need to uh, overcome your hesitation. Yes. Oh, I'm so scared. <laughs> this rodent is considered to be the root cause of a bubonic plague. And this temple is six centuries old. And the, for the whole of the six century history, there has been never, never uh, any disease here. Really? Yeah. For my 30 years, I have been eating with them. Really? And I eat the same food, but they, you can see like, just like this. And I just drink this. So you think this cures plagues? Hello, this is rotten milk with rat feces and dead flies. That's great. That really has to be respected. Yes, they are very holy. Indiana Jones, eat your heart out, because this is the temple. This day is specially auspicious for the worship of the goddess Durga, and the whole village comes together in a celebration that will last through the night. The evening begins with a dance of worship, with the devout carrying flaming pots. Protected by their belief in Mother Durga, they perform deeds they otherwise would not believe possible. will be possessed by the spirit of the goddess. The clay lamps are replaced by the more deadly sword, the weapon that goddess Durga uses in her battle to rid the world of evil.
They come here to purify themselves by bathing in the cold water of the Ganges, the river that nurtured India's 5,000-year-old civilization. Om Kumar is a wheat farmer from central India who told us he walked 300 miles to get here. Why did you come from so far away to the Kumela? He made the journey, he said, because the water has special power. For Hindus, the Ganges is a sacred river and they believe that bathing here during the Kumela will wash away their sins. The pilgrims have set up camp in a sprawling sea of tents that can accommodate tens of millions. It's a pop-up megacity, complete with banks, its own police force and traffic jams. Leading the crowds are the sadhus, who have renounced all material possessions to devote themselves to a spiritual life. One of them is Mahant Ravindranan Saswati, who helped explain Hindu beliefs, including reincarnation. Death to start life. This is yes, uh, true. <laughs> Understand? Most of the pilgrims make do with basic conditions, but for a while. This river is worshipped by millions who flock to her banks to perform daily toiletries and annually dump hundreds of thousands of dead bodies to assure them of a better reincarnation. Its pollution does not dampen the spiritual fervor of the people who believe its waters to be essential for all religious ceremonies. Millions of Indians suffer from malnutrition, disease and poverty. The people are apathetic because their religion has taught them to be detached observers disregarding the agonizing lifestyle which imprisons them. V.S. Naipul, himself an Indian, describes India in the cow, whose urine is even seen as sacred. In goddess Kali, the goddess of death and destruction, who demands to be pacified with blood sacrifices. The religion that has all but destroyed India has now infiltrated every area of Western society. Protesting that it is not religious but scientific, it is transforming our minds, science, medicine, mass media, politics, and the church. Hinduism is most seductive when it wears the mask of Christian terminology and has shockingly managed to disguise itself as the latest Christian thought. Hundreds of thousands of Western pilgrims have journeyed to India seeking enlightenment and have disappeared by the hundreds. All too often they are destroyed by the madness and perversion of the very gurus they have worshipped and looked to for salvation. Today, hundreds of these professing godmen are invading the West. Is there any need for alarm? Or should we continue to welcome these gods of the new age? Okay, so as we can see, that gives you a little bit, be a little better feel of what the true roots of Hinduism is. Let's talk very quickly about some of the gods worshipped in Hinduism. Hindus are at freedom to choose their favorite gods. Remember, there are millions of God and all are accepted as gods and so each individual can choose their own God, the ones that they're more comfortable with. Hinduism is for more towards devotion than theology and that's why it is a complex very complex religion the Hindu Trinity is comprised of Brahma Vishnu and Shiva Brahma is considered the creator Vishnu 
is the sun god of perversion. The seven-headed cobra king. Vishnu's popularity is based on his mystical power to reincarnate. Now remember, reincarnation is a myth, but truly believed. Shiva. Shiva is known as the destroyer. Shiva is linked with sexual immorality and drug addiction like we saw in the documentary just a while ago. In the innermost temples of Shiva is featured the erected phallus. Does that ring a bell? Come on brothers and sisters, does that ring a bell? Do you remember when I was talking to you about Freemasonry? About the erected phallus? Is it any wonder that all pagan religions are so obsessed with sex? Hinduism also, most of their gods have something to do also with sexual perversion. Then you have the god called Shakti, Kali, and Kali is the manifestation, they say, of Shakti, the wife of Shiva, encourages sexual orgies, temple prostitution, and annual human sacrifices like we saw in the documentary just a while ago. Then you have the god called Ganesha, Half elephant, half human. Do you remember when we were just starting out the deliverance ministry and the Holy Spirit led us to clean out our houses of all kinds of things and several of us had elephants in there, replicas of elephants. This elephant is a God that is worshipped. And for the Hindus, it's called Ganesha. It is an idol depicting half elephant, half human. And it is said to bring good luck and to remove obstacles from the path of its worshippers. And that's why many people even ignorantly have little, well, for lack of better words, they're idols. Little statues, figures of elephants because the thing about it is that it is sold as good luck charm and so having one it is understood that you are actually going to have good luck but yet it is a god that is being worshipped then you have the god Kartikeya this is the brother supposedly of Ganesha and this God is worshipped as the God of war. Supposedly, Kartikeya, when you put your trust in him, will win your battles, your wars. And then you have the God, Lakshmi, which is the goddess of wealth, power, fortune, beauty, fertility. And I have three dots there. Because it's much more than these few things that Hindus trust this God Lakshmi for. And again, when you think about the New Age movement, when you talk about the occult, it stems from these things where these spiritualists have gods that they trust to give them wealth, to give them power, to give them fortune, to give them beauty, to give them fertility. It all stems back all the way to Hinduism. Hinduism, they say, actually goes all the way back to 4,000 or 5,000 years. Now in case you don't know how old that is, Christianity only goes back to over 2,000 years. And Hinduism existed almost twice that amount of time before Jesus came to earth 
Then you have the God called Parvati, which is the goddess of motherhood, love, beauty, energy, nourishment, and the list goes on. And, and brothers and sisters, as I name these gods, I want you to bear in mind that there is an idol for all these gods that I'm telling you about. You, we, we can't obtain them here, but there in the Eastern world, you can actually buy the idols for these gods so you can keep them in your home. And I'll tell you what you do with them in your home in a short moment. Now, these gods that I'm sharing with you are just a handful. Because if you go on the internet and you look up some of the main gods of Hinduism, you can't count them. They're just too much. And each of them represent something. But these ones that I've mentioned to you are some of the most popular, most revered and venerated idols for the Hindus. Though Hindus are familiar with literally hundreds and hundreds of gods, Vishnu and Shiva gets the most devotion. There, I believe there is not a Hindu on the planet that does not know the God Vishnu and Shiva. Let's look at the philosophical structure of Hinduism, which are three main things. Karma, reincarnation, and avatars. First of all, karma. Karma is a law of revengeful justice often compared to the law of sowing, sowing and reaping in the Bible. But really it is not. And this is found in Galatians 6 and verse 7. People that are ignorant. Can I just say, for now, Belizeans. If you go to many restaurants and fast foods like the delis, and you go and you buy your Johnny Cakes in the morning and stuff like that, many of them have a little jar for tips that says on it, karma. Belizeans don't know what karma is. And I can almost rest assured that even if they knew what it is, they wouldn't care. Because that's just the nature of who we are. But karma is a law of revengeful justice and it is not the law of sowing and reaping found in the Bible the law of karma has no final judgment you will pay according to karma you will pay for your wrongs until you are good what does that mean that you will come back and be reborn a million times if you need to, to get your life right. And the truth is, no one ever gets their life right. That's why Jesus came. So that law is very revengeful. The law of karma. Because according to Hindus, you're going to have to come back to life again and again to pay for whatever you did in your life. It's consequences is felt in this life, the next, and the next, and the next, and the next, unto infinity. Every act in this life influences the fate of the inner soul in the next incarnation. According to the law of karma, whatever you do now, when you die, and supposedly come back again, what you do now will affect that next life that you get, whether for good or whether for bad. The healthy and wealthy are viewed as having accumulated good karma in a previous life. So when you see wealthy Hindus, when you see healthy Hindus, immediately that is attributed to the fact that when they lived the previous life before the wealthy life that they're living now, 
it's because they're being now paid for the good life that they lived in the previous life that they had. So karma is now paying them what they deserve. Because they strove or strived to live a good life in their prior life. Now they're healthy. Now they're wealthy. Because karma is paying the dividends for their actions in the former life. The less fortunate on the other hand are seen as getting their just reward for past sins in the previous lives. I want you to remember that because in a minute we're going to talk about Maya. And that's not the indigenous people in the south of Belize. This is another belief that Hindus hold. In the system of karma, there is no forgiving savior. To redeem the consequences of one's deeds. No forgiving savior like Christianity. Christianity teaches that as wicked as a man or woman might be. If we come to the Lord Jesus Christ in true forgiveness. What happens? Our sins are forgiven. In the law of karma there is no forgiving savior. You have to be reincarnated again and again and again. Until you get your life right and pay all the consequences for it. Because of this, most Hindus seek moksha, which is freedom from the bondage of karma. Most Hindus have accepted the fact that they will need to be reborn a million times before they finally become perfect. Could you imagine that? How different, how strange it is. Yet, I want you to keep your mind on these things because very soon I will teach again on the occult and the new age spirituality. And you will see that many of the beliefs that Hinduism holds is now found in the new age spirituality and the occult. So now this is no longer just in India. This has invaded the Western Hemisphere. And people are actually swallowing it with everything they have. But listen to what Christian doctrine teaches. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. All things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Karma can't do that. Karma says you're going to live a million times until you get it right and pay all the consequences with suffering and pain until you get it right. The Bible teaches that when a man or a woman comes to Jesus Christ in repentance and accept his sacrifice on Calvary, the Bible says the old is passed away. And that person from God's perspective on the inside is now a different person. A different heart, different desires. The Christian Bible denounces the law of karma. Listen, John 9, 1 through 3. Now as Jesus passed by, he saw a man who was blind from birth. Now, now listen, listen to what the Jewish thought about this. The Jews thought about this blind man. His disciples asked Jesus saying, Rabbi, who sinned? This man or his parents that he was born blind? Jesus answered, neither this man nor his parents sinned but that the works of God should be revealed in him so Jesus flatly denounced the law of karma the Jews the disciples thought that this blind man were paying for the sins that either his parents had committed or he himself had committed in a former life and Jesus said neither of your assertion is Correct. 
The man's suffering is independent of any of his actions or the actions of his parents. Or better stated, what he is going through is independent of any sins he has committed or his parents has committed. So really the Bible denounces the law of karma. Then we move on to reincarnation, which is just a little snippet because reincarnation is a whole big general topic that could go by itself. Reincarnation is a fundamental, essential belief in Hinduism. Christians anticipate a supernatural resurrection of his body like the Bible says. Paul says that when we're raised from the dead, when Jesus comes again, that we will put on new bodies, just like the body, the physical body that Jesus had when he rose from the dead. The book of John told us that when Jesus rose from the dead, the body that he had allowed him to walk through walls. There were no more physical barriers. So the Bible teaches that Christians, when they when Jesus comes back at the resurrection, that we will receive bodies that are supernatural. But listen to what Hindus think about the body. Hindus view the body as the source of his soul's bondage and longs to be eternally free from it. In other words, if the soul of a Hindu did not possess a body, they would be doing much better than they're doing today. The body is what keeps them back from fulfilling where they need to go and what they need to be. The Christian Bible teaches that each human keeps his personal identity for all eternity. So as a Christian, when you die... You're not going to be somebody else. You're still going to be you. You don't change. Whoever you are now, that's who you're going to be for the rest of eternity. That's what the Bible teaches. Your identity will never change. Hinduism teaches that the consciousness of each individual is irrelevant since he may come back after death as a monkey, or a goat, or a cow, or even a plant. Are you understanding what I'm saying now? The Christian Bible teaches that our identity never changes. Who you are now, you will be for all eternity. But Hinduism teaches that that's irrelevant. Because in reincarnation... When they throw the first life off and they get another one, they will not be the same person. They might come back as a plant, as an animal, a cow, a rat, or whatever it is. Therefore, it is irrelevant. But the Bible strongly denounces reincarnation. In Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 27... The Bible says, and as it is appointed for men to die, how many times? Once. And after this is judgment. The Bible says we are only allowed to live once and to die once. Talking about in the physical form. Hinduism teaches reincarnation and you can be reincarnated a million times. And you, can, you may come back. You don't even determine what you're going to come back as. You might just be the tree in a yard that your great-grandchild will look at and say, where are the fruits? I want some fruits. Not knowing that the great-grandchild is talking to a great-grandfather who is now a tree. I mean, it sounds foolish. And I'm not mocking anything or anyone. This is reincarnation. But the Bible says of Christians, we never lose our identity and we're only allowed to die once. And then comes judgment. Are you with me so far? In contrast to reincarnation or reincarnation's uncertain game of chance, 
the Bible says the following. So in, in other words, reincarnation is a game of chance. When I die and I come back again, I might just have a better life. That's taking a chance. It's like Russia roulette. Or it's like bolido. Or lottery. Where you go and you buy your number. You cross your finger and hope to die. John 5, 28 and 29. Don't tell me I'm the, I'm the only guilty one here. Because before I met Christ, I used to buy bolido. And may I say to you that sometimes I used to win. But I don't do that anymore. That's just simply, I, I am far more blessed today than any bolido can make me. And I'm sure you are the same today. In John 5, 28 and 29, the Bible teaches this. Do not marvel at this for the hour is coming in which all who are in the graves will hear his voice, Jesus' voice, and come forth. Listen. Those who have done good will go to the resurrection of life, and those who have done evil to the resurrection of condemnation. There are no chances there. This is certainty. The Bible teaches that the good will go, good in Christ will get to go to heaven, and the wicked gets to go to hell. While reincarnation teaches, take a chance, who knows? It might work favorably for you. Because of the hopelessness, listen carefully. Because of the hopelessness found in karma and reincarnation, Hindu philosophers needed to inject some ray of hope. They introduced the concept of avatar. Avatars, the supposedly physical manifestation of impersonal Hindu gods. I want to direct your attention to the fact that all religions outside of Christianity, in one way or the other, burrows from Christianity. Let me show you. God, who was impersonal, the Father I'm talking about, who was impersonal, cannot be seen. Because the Bible says if you see God the Father, you die. Because He is unapproachable light. So what did God do? God come down, came down to humanity in the form of Jesus Christ so we could know the Father. So Hinduism also teaches that all the gods, the hundreds, the thousands, the millions of gods, they're all impersonal. Therefore, they came up with the philosophy of Avatar, which now teaches that these gods, once in a lifetime of each Hindu, once in a lifetime, and that doesn't mean it happens at all, this is just the philosophy, that once in the lifetime of a Hindu, that their god, whichever one was their favorite god, that god, by becoming an Avatar, can actually present himself to be known by the worshiper, the Hindu worshiper. Hinduism teaches that Hindu gods can incarnate when deemed necessary. The supposedly incarnation of Hindu gods would be once in a lifetime for the Hindu. How many times have you felt Jesus? If you worship the Lord and you're in His presence every day, you can feel Jesus every single day. The tangible manifestation of the Lord. Hinduism promises that you can, if you're lucky, you can have one of these gods manifest themselves once in your lifetime. Krishna is the eighth avatar of the God Vishnu. So in other words, for the Hindu, Vishnu cannot be experienced as Vishnu, but he becomes the avatar called Krishna so that the worshiper can get to know Vishnu. 
And then you have Buddha, another avatar. So again, I remind you that Krishna is an avatar. It's a manifestation of the God called Vishnu. Buddha is another avatar of Vishnu. Hindu doctrine of Maya. Listen. The magical power of illusion of the gods. That's what Maya means or suggests. The magical power of illusion of the gods. And listen carefully to what this Maya is. Because for every wrong doctrine has to be added another wrong doctrine to support the wrong doctrine so that it can make a little bit more sense. So, the hin for Hindus, Maya is the one word that explains the massive suffering and poverty in India. No one can deny the fact that India is filled with poverty and suffering and even starvation. The doctrine of Maya suggests that pain and suffering are nothing but illusion. Are you listening? So if you see somebody suffering, don't bother about it. That's just an illusion. Do you understand? So there's no help for the brother. There's no help for the sister. There's no help for anyone. Because when you see suffering, when you see pain, it's just an illusion. That's what Maya suggests. Therefore, any effort to alleviate pain and suffering is worthless and meaningless. That's why there has never been any help for India. Why? Because they don't think they need help. They think that the suffering and the pain and the starvation and whatever else might it be, it's all just an illusion. That's why millions of Hindus sleep on sidewalks, and naked children bathe in gutters. Now in Belize, we do have a few people that sleeps on sidewalks, but we're talking here in the millions. Remember, India has way over a billion people in India. And many, many millions or hundreds of thousands of Hindus are actually destitute. Sleep on sidewalks and kids can, can be seen Actually bathing at the gutter because of the situation and circumstances. Countless lepers and deformed people beg for bread on the street side. Countless homeless, neglected, abandoned children digging through garbage, searching for food. And why doesn't the rich help? Why doesn't the middle class help? Because it's an illusion. Are you getting where I'm coming from? Why lift a finger to do anything about it? That's just an illusion. The doctrine of Maya suggests that to extend any kindness to the less fortunate would be to disobey the law of karma. So put the two pieces together now. Karma suggests that you are paying for your wrongs in your previous, that you did in your previous life. So now Maya comes in and says, don't mess with that person's suffering, the misfortune, because if you help them, you're breaking the law of karma. They are actually just paying, and it's good for them to pay, because in this life now when they die, they might come back a better person. So by you helping them, you are actually stopping them from becoming a better person in the next life. Are you seeing the bigger picture? Karma says, you've done wrong in your past life, you need to pay now. Then when you're reborn again, you do wrong again. And karma says you'll die again and you'll have to come back again. And while you're suffering in all the lives that you're living, Maya says, let the man suffer. Let the woman suffer. Let the child suffer. Because if you break the law of karma, they will never be perfect one day.
Karma says they're suffering for their own sins in their past life. Therefore, lending any assistance would violate the principle of divine vengeance. Hinduism has no single system of salvation. Do you remember that I taught on a lesson yoga? The Kundalina spirit? Yes. Well, this is where it was birthed in India. And why yoga? Well, let me show you. Hinduism has no single system of salvation but yoga. The word yoga means union with God. So every time Hindus and now actually the Westerners, people in North America, Central America, South America, Wherever in the world now that people practice yoga, what are they trying to do? Because there is no form of salvation, yoga means union with God. If I practice yoga and I do it diligently, systematically, one day I will have union with God. In other words, I have to work for my own salvation. Yoga offers four different pathways to God. Number one, you have bhakti yoga. And that is the way of devotion to God. One of the most popular yogas. Then you have karma yoga, which is the service of good works. Notice again. All religions apart from Christianity practice good works. You have to work out your own salvation. Number three, Jnana Yoga. The way of knowledge, seeking out gurus and Hindu scripture and meditating. This is where transcendental meditation comes from. In yoga, there's always a blanking out of the mind. And whenever there's a blanking out of the mind, demons come in. The Bible encourages meditation, but never to blank out your mind. The Bible encourages meditation based on scripture. You meditate on God's word. But, but people that practices yoga actually practices blanking out the mind where you think nothing at all. And when they reach that place, demons get in and start to control the mind. And number four, I wish I could say it like the Hindu, Raja Yoga. The way of contemplation to the royal road, exploring meditation and Techniques. Again, if you go back to the occult and the spiritual movement that is happening in the world today, you will find out that one of the biggest things in there is meditation. Chanting meditation. Where did it come from? From Hinduism. The devotee to yoga must learn to discipline his body and mind to obtain union with God. So when yoga is practiced, and by the way, I was with my youngest daughter today out there on the beach getting something, and I showed her, look, another sign that says yoga. Do you know five years ago, only five years ago, no form of yoga was on this island as far as I know, or at least the signs weren't posted. Now, a lot of resorts, when you go, they have signs that says yoga on it. May I just tell you what's happening? Demons are infiltrating our island and our Belizeans are sucking it up big time. What is happening? Yoga is trying to reach the place of union with God, which is very occultic and new age. And it is introducing demons into the persons. As a matter of fact, all these things are now happening even in massage. When people are getting massage and stuff, all kinds of things are happening, which we'll talk about in another lesson. So, 
the, the, the devotee to yoga must learn the discipline, his body, and to obtain union with God, including doing endless array of idolatrous ceremonies and rituals. Now, the little small fry that is learning yoga won't do ceremonies and rituals, but the teachers are well into this. And eventually, the devotees, the trainees, or, or the students of yoga will one day as they continue get into the ceremonies and rituals of yoga. It also includes deities, which is nothing but an idol, kept in home. And listen now carefully. These idols must be awakened every morning. They must be washed. They must be fed. And they must be put to sleep each night. I often say to myself, and this is no form of mockery. This is just reality. If I had to help my God to go to sleep, and if I had to bathe him and feed him, he wouldn't be my God. Because I have a God to help me. But if my God needs my help, what kind of God are you? Do you understand the logic behind that? But for many Hindus, and this is not just Hindu. The New Age spirituality and the occult and Satanism. These things happen there. But where was it birthed? In the mother of false religion, which is Hinduism. But could you imagine having your little idol? And every morning you give him a kiss and you wake him up and say, Hi, it's morning. Let me give you a good bath and when I finish bathing you, I'm going to feed you. And then you just stand there while I worship you. And then when the sun sets, I'm going to put you to sleep again. And the cycle continues over and over again. Let's quickly look at some bizarre, sacred Hindu practices. These are called ahimsa or non-injury to living things. Ahimsa, non-injury to living things. And here are some of the bizarreness of these things. And because of this sacred belief called ahimsa, most Hindus are vegetarians. I'll say this and I know that maybe I'll be condemned for it. Because most people don't know the spiritual side of life. All they know is the physical. But why would most or all pagan religions, New Age spirituality, the occult, you come in contact with these people, Almost all of them are vegetarians. And vegetarians think that they are healthy. But I want to tell you something. That might be true physically. But what has not been told is on the spiritual side. When you're just a vegetarian or a vegan. You are lacking the necessary nutrients for the mind, for the brain, where the demons come and invade and weaken you mentally. So as a vegetarian and a vegan, you might feel good physically, but spiritually you are being weakened. And that's why pagan religions are big on vegetarian and vegan. Because behind these practices are actually demons that know how to weaken the person so that they can continue to control their lives. Are you with me? In Genesis chapter 9 and verse 3, here's what the Bible says. Every creature that lives and moves will be food for you. Can somebody name me a creature? Any creature. The cow. The pig. The chicken. Fish. Bird. All of these things the Bible says God gave for food. I want you to listen carefully. 
Because a lot of religions today tell you don't eat this, don't eat that, don't eat the other. Why? Because it is a sin. No, it's not. Now, not every food is healthy for you in large measures. But behind the belief of being a vegetarian and vegan is the fact that I don't want to hurt animals. Let me explain to you. In 1 Corinthians 10, 30 and 32, if I eat what is served to me, grateful to God for what is on the table, how can I worry about what someone will say? I thanked God for it and He blessed it. But listen. Did you see on the documentary, the rats are being deified? Did you hear what the man said? He said, the rats are holy. Therefore, the feces is holy. The urine is holy. And I want to be holy. So I'm going to eat the feces and I'm going to drink the urine because I want to be holy. You know, pagan religions fail to understand that man was created higher than animal. And for us to look to an animal as a more divine being, a holy being than a person, we're slapping God in the face. But rats are considered sacred and worship and fed while children are being starved. I want to interject something here quickly. A lady came into our yard today, North American lady. She was looking for the beauty salon. And she came in through the wrong gate and she stood and she saw my big German shepherd with this big chain around his neck. And she started to insinuate that it's wrong to do a dog that. But how come it's not wrong for the millions of baby that North Americans abort but it's wrong to chain a dog. Are you seeing where I'm coming from? Animals are being deified while humans are being demoted. When the Bible says that humans are higher in status than animals. How dare the evolutionists say that my ancestor was a monkey. Absolutely not. Never came from there and I'll never become one. Now I do eat bananas. But that doesn't make me a monkey. But really and truly. Not only in India now but even in North America. There are kids starving. Wild dogs and cats are fat. Sleeping in beds. While kids don't have a home. Really and truly. Paganism has stepped in. I love my dog. My dog gets fed twice a day. Gets loosed every night to run around. But you'll never find my dog in my house or my bed. My house is for me and my family. Not for my dog. So rats are considered sacred to the Hindu and are worshipped and fed while children are being starved. Faithful worshippers of rat drink the urine and eat its feces. Cows are considered sacred and get the most publicity. My son, about 12, 13 years ago, went to India. What part of India did you go, son? Dubai. When he went to Dubai, he said every time a cow was getting ready to cross the street, everything had to come to a halt. You stop. And if the cow decides he wants to sit in the middle of the road for an hour, you have to wait an hour. Why? Because a God just showed up. I am not mocking or ridiculing 
I am just showing you that when the Bible says in Romans chapter 1 that we choose to take God out of our minds, we become debased. We become void of understanding. So faithful worshipers of cows, drinks, it's urine, and use the manure to rub on themselves since it is holy. And then you have a branch of Hinduism called Jainism. Jainism goes even farther. Jainism is, is a branch of the Indian religion, considers everything to be holy. So much so that the, the, the devotees of Jainism, listen carefully, never brush their teeth in fear of killing holy bacteria in the mouth. Now this is not all Hindus. This is not mainstream Hindu. But this is a branch of Hinduism called Jainism. They never bathe. Help me Lord. They never bathe or sleep on a bed in fear of killing holy viruses and bacteria. Now, now this is how far it can go. And that's the way demons work. They desensitize. No one will ever just jump into doing nonsense just all of a sudden. It's slow desensitization that happens. It is said that if you have boiling water in a pot and you throw a frog in there, that frog will instantly jump out. But if you put a frog in water while on the stove and it slowly heats up, the frog will remain in there until it dies because the heat comes on slowly. And that's the way the devil works. He will never throw you into a boiling pan in an instant because he knows you're going to get out instantly. He brainwashes slowly but surely until you can no longer see light. It's all dark. Now, if you by birth are Hindu or Hindu is in your bloodline or you are married to a Hindu, I'm talking now not only to people in here, but people that are watching from around the world, across the country of Belize. There are lots of Indians here in Belize, and Belizeans have married Hindus. If you by birth are Hindu, or Hindu is in your bloodline, or you married a Hindu, you have acquired demons that now live inside of you. These demons have to be renounced and cast out, they will keep you back from experiencing the fullness of the presence of Jesus Christ. Again, this is nothing to be ashamed about. Because you might not even have been involved in any of these things. But when you are attached by your bloodline, these things are connected. Let me tell you something. You, just for you individually, and this is not just Hinduism. This is just any form of darkness that is living inside of you. You want to know if you have a demon? You want to know if there are any form, any kind of dark spirits living inside of you? You turn up your devotion with Christ. You start to get serious with God and you put certain hours of worship every day and you start to seek Him with all your heart. All of a sudden, you're going to become some of the most miserable people, angry people. You're going to feel frustrated and all kinds of things. Why? Because when God's presence is far, demons are comfortable. But when the presence of Jesus shows up, they're in trouble. They can't hide anymore. Are you with me? Now, as I close today, I want to ask you to put down your outline. And if you see it necessary for you to renounce all the following that I'm going to have you renounce, those of you watching from around the world here in Belize, like I said, if you are a Hindu, 
Your parents were Hindus. You've been married to a Hindu. You may want to renounce these things and take it very seriously. Renouncing is saying, I put these things away. I don't want to have anything to do with them. So I want you to bow your heads and close your eyes. And I want you to renounce all these things from your heart. If you see or think it's necessary. Say it loudly with me. I renounce all sacred writings of Hinduism. Rig Veda. Bhagavad Gita. Atar Va Veda. Atar Va Veda. Say it. Sama Veda. Vedas. Maha Bharata. These are all sacred writings, okay? Aranyakas. Upanishads. Yajur Vida. Puranas. I renounce all doctrines and teachings of Hinduism. I renounce Hindu anarchy. I renounce witchcraft and idolatry in all its forms. I renounce all 33 million gods of Hinduism. I renounce Krishna, Brahma, Vishnu, Shiva, Shakti, Kali, Ganesha, Kartieka, Lakshmi, Parvati, Buddha. I renounce reincarnation, karma, and all avatars of Hinduism. I renounce Maksha. I renounce spiritual evolution. I renounce Maya. I renounce Ahisma. I renounce Bhakti Yoga. Karma Yoga. Jnana Yoga. Raja Yoga. I renounce all pagan ceremonies and rituals of Hinduism. I renounce veneration of all animals, bacterias, and viruses. I renounce my father's bloodline with every form of witchcraft that was passed on to me. I renounce my mother's bloodline with every form of witchcraft that was passed on to me. Heavenly Father, please forgive me and all my ancestors for sinning against you in the abominable practices of Hinduism. I personally repent on behalf of my ancestors and I thank you for your forgiveness. I now humbly ask you to remove every curse that is active in my life because of being directly or indirectly involved in the practice of Hinduism. Please wash me in your precious shed blood, Lord Jesus, and make me whole. I now choose to love you, serve you, and live for you from this day forward. Please let me know you in a very personal way. Fill me with your Holy Spirit in my spirit, soul, and body. In the name of Jesus, amen. Now let me pray for you. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus the Christ, I now come against all these gods, all these spirits, and all these curses that might have attached itself to any of your children. Because of the bloodline, because of their own practices, 
They have already renounced it. And now I command these spirits and curses to be removed from their lives. I cancel them out and I send them back to the pit. I apply the shed blood of Jesus against it. And now precious Holy Ghost, I ask you to come in and fill the souls of these people in every area where a demon might have occupied or in any area where curses may have attached itself. May they now be uprooted, be broken, and be replaced with the precious power of the Holy Spirit and the blood of the Lamb. We thank you for freedom tonight, Lord God, for loosing any individual that was bound in these ways. And we give you all the praise and glory in Jesus' mighty name. And everybody said, Praise the Lord. Amen. Let's prepare to move into our night of vigil. You may get up for a while and just...